Hey there, this is MathCamp321, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to work with the second fundamental theorem of calculus, or the second FTC. The second fundamental theorem of calculus is a discussion about what happens when you take the derivative of an integral. And if you look below, I've notated that theorem using symbols. So we start with ddx, which means find the derivative of. Well, what is it we're finding the derivative of? We're finding the derivative of this function, f of t, which is in the format of a definite integral. Now, for the second fundamental theorem of calculus to work, there has to be a couple of conditions that are met. The first condition is that the lower limit of integration has to be some constant. That is, this letter a, or the variable a, must represent a constant. The other condition that must be met is that the upper limit must be some expression containing x. If those two conditions are met, all you're going to do when you take the derivative of this integral is you're going to take that expression on top and you're going to replace or substitute it in for every occurrence of t. So the result is that you're going to end up getting f of x. You started with f of t, but you're going to end up getting f of x. It's that simple. Now at first, it probably doesn't seem that way. It probably seems confusing and overwhelming and you don't even know why we're doing this. But we're going to look at a few examples and I'm pretty sure it's going to become clear how this can be helpful. Okay, so now we're on slide number two and I'm going to try to convince you that this theorem actually works. And we're going to do that by looking at a specific example. And in this example, we're going to be making modifications to the right hand side of the equation and then when we're done we're going to be finding a derivative. So you'll notice in the, in the question we're given a function f of x and that function is described as an integral and ultimately I want to take the derivative of this function which means I'm going to take the derivative of an integral which is what this whole second fundamental theorem of calculus is all about. So I'm going to start by making a modification to the right hand side and that is I'm going to rewrite the square root of t as t to the one half. The next thing that I'm going to do is actually take the antiderivative by raising the power by one and multiplying by the reciprocal. The next thing that I'm going to do is first plug in x for t and then plug in 4 for t and seek out the difference. And now I'll clean this up a little bit, especially looking at the second term. The square root of 4 is 2, 2 cubed is 8, and 8 times 2 thirds will be 16 thirds. So I've successfully simplified the right hand side. Now that I've done that, I'm going to find its derivative. Because I've run out of room, I'm going to move to the top right column and I'll write down where we left off. At this time I'm going to take the derivative. So we've got to go back to the earlier portion of this course where I'm going to take the derivative of each of these terms. Remember that when I take the derivative of a constant you end up getting zero for that term. So it's really only the first term that I have to think about. Three halves times two thirds is one and then I'm going to drop the power by one from three halves to one half. So this is the derivative and this can be notated as the square root of x. So I'd like you to note this result, the square root of x, and I'd like you to compare that result with what would have happened if I hadn't done any of this work and I had just taken this upper expression and plugged it in for this t. If I had taken that x and plugged it in, I would have gotten root x. I would have gotten the answer without doing any of this work. And that's what the second fundamental theorem of calculus is all about. Let's take a look at another example. So we're on the next slide where I plan to convince you even further that this second fundamental theorem of calculus works. So again, I'm going to work only on the right hand side and once I get a suitable expression, then I'm going to take the derivative. So I'm going to start by looking at the right hand side and take the antiderivative of this uh, trinomial. 
So I'm gonna raise the power and then multiply by the reciprocal for each of those cases. And when I do that, I'm gonna end up getting t cubed plus t squared plus t. Now I'll substitute in x for all occurrences of t, followed by substituting in one for all occurrences of t, and then I'll subtract the results. Now, one cubed plus one squared plus one is really just three. So my final function will be x cubed plus x squared plus x minus three. Now that I have my function in order, I can go to the second part of the question, which is to find f prime of x, or to find the derivative of that function. I'm gonna start with just a rewrite of what I had. Okay, and now I'm ready to take the derivative. So I'm just gonna move from term to term, applying the general power rule. So the three jumps down in front, and I reduce the power by one to a two. In this case, the two jumps down in front, and the power drops from a two to a one, and here the derivative of x is just one, and then of course the derivative of a constant is just zero, it's gonna go away, so there's no need to write anything. So what I'd like you to notice is the result that I got. The result is 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. And it took me one, two, three, four steps to get to that answer. If we had just gone right with the second fundamental theorem of calculus, that would have said that, hey, since we're taking the derivative of this thing, which is an integral, we can replace every occurrence of t with this x. So if we plug the x in there, and we plug the x in there, that's the only places for me to plug in x, I would have gotten 3x squared plus 2x plus 1, which is exactly this over here. So the second fundamental theorem of calculus allows us to very quickly come up, th come up with the answer if and only if we're taking the derivative of an integral and the lower limit of that integral is a constant and the upper limit is some expression that contains an x. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, so in this next slide, the difficulty is escalated just a little bit. Once again, we're asked to find the derivative of an integral. Our lower limit is a number, a constant, but this time our upper limit is an expression that contains an x, but it's not as simple as just an x. It is an x squared, and that's gonna make a little bit of a difference. So what we're gonna do is the same procedure that we've done in the first two problems, working only with the right-hand side. Once we have a suitable expression for f of x, then we'll go ahead and take the derivative and see what kind of connections we can make. So I'm gonna start by taking the antiderivative of t plus three. The next thing I'll do is substitute for all occurrences of t in x squared, followed by substituting in zero for all occurrences of t, and then finding the difference. As I simplify further, you may have noticed that the whole second part of the problem is just gonna go away because we've substituted in zero. So the whole second portion is just gonna drop out. So we just really need to focus on the first portion, which will be one half x to the fourth plus three x squared. Now that I have a suitable expression for f of x, I'm gonna to move to the top of the right side of the slide and take the derivative. Okay, so when I take the derivative here, there is two terms. I'm just gonna travel from term to term. The four is gonna drop down in front. Four times one half is two. And then I'm gonna drop the power from a four to a three. And then for the second term, the two is gonna come down in front, giving me a net of six x, and I'll drop the power from a two to a one. So just 2x cubed plus 6x. Now what I notice is that there's something that I can factor out of both of those terms, and that is a 2x. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to factor out that GCF of 2x. And when I do that, I'm left with a new expression, x squared plus three. Now, I was able to come up with this derivative by doing quite a few steps, one, two, three, four, five steps. If I had used the second fundamental theorem of calculus, what I would have essentially done is I would have taken the expression on the upper portion of the limit, 
and I would have inserted or substituted that in for x, which would have left me with x squared plus 3, which is what I have here. But I would also have to multiply by the derivative of this x squared, which is 2x, and that's where this guy comes in right here. So if this is ever something more complicated than just an x, you insert whatever that complicated expression is in for t, but then you multiply by its derivative on the outside. So that's where the 2x comes from. So we're on the next slide, and once again, our upper limit of integration is something a little bit more complex than just an x. It's a 3x. Let's start by working only with the right-hand side and actually finding the antiderivative of sine, which happens to be negative cosine. It also should be noted that if you look really quickly at the bottom limit of integration, you might think it's a variable, but it's actually pi, and pi is just a constant, which is what we need in order for the second fundamental theorem of calculus to work. So now I'm going to substitute in for t, 3x, followed by substituting in pi and finding the difference. Cleaning this up, we know that pi, or the cosine of pi, is negative 1. So what we end up with here is negative cosine 3x minus 1. That's a nice suitable expression for f of x. Now that I've found that, I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative. Now, a couple things to note. The second term here is a constant, and when I take the derivative of negative 1, it's just going to go away. When I take the derivative of the cosine expression, because the argument has a 3 in it, it's going to require the chain rule. So that's just something to think about before we get started here. So I'm going to seek out the derivative, which means I'll notate accordingly. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, but we already have a negative in front of that. So the answer is going to be sine 3x times the derivative of the inside, which is 3. So this is our derivative, and it took me one, two, three, four, about five steps to get to it. Could I have done this much more quickly if I had just used the second fundamental theorem of calculus? Well, what that says we could have done is we could have taken this upper expression, which in this case is 3x. We could have substituted that in for every occurrence of t, which would have gotten me sine, three t sine 3x, which is what I have here. But then you would also need to multiply the result by the derivative of this, which would be 3, and that's where this 3 comes from right here. So the answer is yes. All of the problems that we've just done, numbers 1 through 4, could have been done much more quickly had we just applied the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And now that we're much more comfortable with what it means, we can actually execute that theorem without doing all of this extra legwork.